Now more than ever, it's important for you and your family to enjoy the spaces you're in most often. Visit fergusonshowrooms.com to shop online or schedule a personalized consultation to meet with our experts at your local Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery. Together, we'll help you make the most of home and create a space you'll love to live in. Get started on your project and discover extraordinary products like the Orizo Chandelier from Progress Lighting. Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. improves children's health by developing better treatments and technologies. As one of the top children's hospitals in the nation, we take on the most complex, rare, and life-threatening conditions because all children deserve a healthy future. And with our new pediatric focus research and innovation campus opening this spring, we'll be able to generate and share even more discoveries. Learn more at childrensnational.org slash innovation. Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. Today I have a special interview for you from the wonderful Venny Koshis. Venny grew up in Sam Fife's Move of God and in this episode she will testify to the abuse and traumas inflicted on children in this movement and potentially other movements all over the world today. We were supposed to cover Shinchunji throughout March, but because of some technical issues, I've had to postpone this week's Shinchunji episode until later on in the year, but we will recommence the coverage next week as planned. If you haven't already, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm also uploading episodes to YouTube, so you can subscribe here and find me on Twitter and Instagram at Colt Vault Pod. Every follow helps me. I have just released this month's exclusive episode on Patreon, which is available for only £1 a month at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. Now, enough of business. Here is Venny, but I must warn that this episode does come with themes of child abuse and molestation. Hi, Venny, and thank you so much for joining me today. This episode is one that has actually been requested a number of times through uh, Reddit and through emails. So now I am very lucky to have you here today to talk me through your experiences. Would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners? Oh, Casey, thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm, I'm an author, an artist, a cult child, um, a very passionate advocate for ending child abuse, healing religious trauma, healing generational trauma. So definitely moving into the thriving section and writing some more books. Fantastic. Fantastic. And what is the, uh, what is the name of uh, your book that people can go and find at the moment? I have a memoir entitled Cult Child, which is written in first person and recounts all of my experiences growing up uh, in this cult. It's available in ebook and paperback. I always encourage the paperback because it's filled with footnotes that allow you to take the Bible and reference how they used certain scriptures. Um, It has a glossary of terms. It has sermon quotes and pictures. And so it's really also a reference book. Um, I have two other books as well. So, but we could talk about those later. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Cold Child is my main uh, memoir and I'm writing the sequel of what life was like after the cult and how I transitioned from that to secular life. So amazing. And is there a, a date in mind for this or, or, or should we just wait and see? I'm over halfway through writing it. The, the outline's all done. Um, you know, as we know, writing trauma is an emotional uh, thing. So I'm hoping to have it done by the end of the year, but on that one, I, hesitate to put deadlines just because Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. again the emotional aspect of it can sometimes pull you back a little so absolutely and what is the name of this movement that you grew up in it started out being called Sam Fife's move of God. So (laughs) we cult kids have this acronym for this cult we call it smog. Sam Fife's move of God, because it's this vile structure and the ideologies 
definitely created a smog, you know, that's lingered mm-hmm, over mm-hmm. its existence. Um, and it was uh, conceived in 1960. So smog, Samphive's move of God, either one. Uh, but they, they, you know, they, they put a lot of names to it. The move, the walk, the body. So there was these interchangeable words. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But for the most part, we call it the move. We call current members move lights. Um, so, yeah. And is this something that you were born into? Well, my father was in the Navy and one of his Naval friends, uh, his wife began to recruit my mother before I was even born. Right. Um, so, so they followed my mother all the way into the cult, right? The procession. And then when my mother joined uh this female recruiter basically shunned her uh she became an elder and shunned her so when my mom finally took us away from my father and physically left i was three uh but before that um so so my mother officially left for this wilderness demon deliverance farm in 1973 and I was born in 69. Right. So at that time I was 3, okay? So in those 3 years before she went off to a compound and when I say compound like picture Jim Jones. Right. Yeah. That's the that's how I can explain it very primitive and, Okay. Um, right? Uh self-sustained um um so before this, we'd spent like our childhood going to church at the moves body houses is what they called them. So they were houses um, in different cities where they would invite people to church and mm-hmm. Bible study in the living room. And the one we went to was in Hammett, California. And church was held in the living room. We also went occasionally to this farm that was owned by an elderly lady that we called Granny Sweat. Okay. And I recall like many people gathered at Granny Sweat's farm on numerous occasions. So I'm like two or three at this point in my life. So they would have church at the body houses, but then they would have these retreats where like people from all over would come to the farm, uh, kind of like convention style. So that's what was going on in those three years before we went to the first compound. Right, right. Okay. And is it just you and your mom at this point or do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have two uh, siblings. My sister's four years older than me and my brother is six years older than me. So um, let's see, my sister would have been seven and he was nine. Mm -hmm. So they have sort of more vivid memories of of these earlier years than than you may have. Yeah. Is this something well, that you've you sat know, down and... my actually my memories pre coal are very vivid, very vivid. Um, I've spoken with a lot of child survivors who had this small little period, you know, of of like one through three that they actually have quite clear memories. And some people will say, "How can you remember back then?" Oh, you can. You definitely can remember two and three years old. So I remember good memories with my father, you know, and then I remember trauma. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I I don't have too many memories of being early, early years, but there is there is one event where I took the top of my finger off and I was mm-hmm. three. And that's something that I can remember quite vividly. So mm-hmm. I, I, I was going to mention there that I think trauma, especially is something that, you can remember early on if your brain yeah. hasn't done that magical thing that it does where right. it makes you forget that it ever happened. Traumatic amnesia. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at this point, you, when you move to the first compound, you have no more contact with your father. Well, um, okay. So at the first compound, it was located in Ware, Massachusetts. And as soon as we got there, 
I was immediately separated from my mother. Oh, no. So the children were taken from the parents and put into these classification units with children your same age. So this compound was an old military base. So it had a barracks. It had a covered walkway to this white house that was once an officer's quarters. And that's where my brother was with the boys. So we had handlers over each of our groups. For instance, my brother was placed uh, with other boys his age and had a handler named Frank Argeno. Uh, the handler for my age group was Debbie Hale. And she had like these assistants who helped to manage us children. So for four years of my life between the ages of three and seven, I was not allowed to speak, look at, talk to, or have any type of contact with my family. Oh my we goodness. saw each other in the, in the dining room but we're not allowed to speak to each other. So, you know, like an average day on this compound, you're awakened up at about 4 a.m. to Oof. go out and work in the fields, okay? So you have children, three, four, five, on their hands and knees for two hours before breakfast, oh, no. uh, picking weeds, picking grubs off the bottom of potato plants. So then after that, we'd go to breakfast. Uh, where we ate silently because we had to listen to taped sermons. No. Um, so Massachusetts was like, it was a horror camp. Um, we children were not given love, uh, never held. Um, that was Sam Fife believed in a doctrine of uh, children were born with a beast nature. So giving them love and doting on them was spoiling and against the Bible. Oh. So yes, the beatings, the molestation started immediately. Um, they dissected my mother by starving her. She was overweight. That's what sent us there. She had a demon of gluttony. Right. So they classified you. They assessed your family. What were your needs? And what, what you know, qualities did you have that they could use you for? And okay. that's how they assessed where to send you, right? So for us, you know, we went to a place where our, we, we were turned into slave worker bees. And so to get someone into that place, you know, it just extreme torture. Um, mm -hmm. My brother recalls being taken into the elder's wife's office. Her name was Frida. And having other parents be brought in where my mother was used as, I'm sorry, my brother was used as this model to teach these other parents the proper way to beat their child. So no. oh my it was very methodical. It was not like, yeah. you know, it was part of the practice uh, very much held up by, again, that's why I encourage people to buy the paperback of my book. Mm -hmm. I reference sermons and Bible verses that they used to solidify this behavior. Um, so, you know, that was important for me to do because a lot of people will say, well, that's not real religion. It is. Every single thing they did was 100% backed up by the Bible, uh, very mm -hmm. Old Testament and things like that. Um, so if a family or an individual was deemed to be possessed with demons, they were always sent to these deliverance farms uh, because you had exorcisms. And then also they felt like harsh labor, right? If they work you 12, 14 hours a day, that would cast out a demon. Um, and I go into detail about this uh, in my book, you mm -hmm. know, um, like seeing my mother, one, one vivid memory, I might have been around five, is I used to look at my mom in the dining room and just like, pray that she would look up and look at me and catch my eyes. Um, and she never did. But I remember seeing her like more gaunt than ever. And she had pushed herself up off the table with her fists because she was weak and shaky. Um, so they, you know, were working people all day, feeding them a half a cup of food three times a day and just dissecting them. And you're so tiny at this point. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what circumstances are you living in in terms of where you sleep? Are you, are you put sort of 
in in a barrack style accommodation or yes. are you in a home with mm-hmm. like other guardians who aren't your your parents at this point um the what they call the tabernacle which is you know the word is patterned after the tabernacle in the bible uh was very much built like a mess hall so the downstairs had um, already a cafeteria style kitchen so you would walk down with your tray much like at school to get your food served to you and Mm -hmm. then that was pushed aside and the tables stacked up and the benches for the tables were put out and that's where we also had church Mm -hmm. there was a nursery down there with one of those half swinging doors then you went upstairs and everything was built barrack style, bunk beds, bunk right, beds, bunk right. beds, bunk beds. Uh, so in the room that I was in, just several bunk beds. And then Debbie Hill had a bed at the end of the room, like old style military bed with the springs, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the cult leader and his wife, they both lived up there, but they each had separate bedrooms. Right. And then downstairs, there was an elder's office. And I do not remember any of these, but my brother said that my dad would call the compound to talk with us uh, kids and we'd all be taken into the elder's office. And um, But there'd be an elder and my mother sitting in there. So my brother and sister could never, you know, say, help me, dad. You yeah, know, this is yeah. happening to us. Yeah. And at this point, I mean, you, you, you've mentioned there that you don't remember too much of it, but that your that your brother does. Um, and, and, and you've mentioned that there was elders, but also the cult leader. So you have Sam Fife as sort mm-hmm. of the um, the leader of the movement and then right. elders as well. So is there sort of like a pyramid system of positions yes. of power? Yes. Yeah, so you had Sam Fife as the leader and then he had what he called his father ministry. Okay. Like Buddy Cobb, Doug McLean, Bill Greer, John Henson, they all traveled around, right? Recruiting and preaching. And then the elders, they ran individual compounds. So they lived there. And Sam flew around. He, he, they owned a fleet of private planes. Right. And they flew here and there. Um, Buddy Cobb was a, a pilot. And I think Sam Fife was a pilot as well. Um so that's how the hierarchy went. So absolutely 100% class system. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. had the elders. Now, I do know elders children who had it real bad in their family. So I can't sit here and say an absolute that if you were an elders kid, you had it better. Okay. Uh, maybe an 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the elders mm-hmm, kids mm-hmm. had it better and 20% didn't. And then they did that matching thing. You know, want to make sure an elder's kid kind of gets with an elder's kid or, yeah, you know, people right, of yeah. upper echelon stay together. Right. And I know that in some of these situations, single parents can be treated differently as well. Is that something that you mm-hmm. think your mom may have experienced? Absolutely. And the irony of that is that my father ended up, we ended up in San Diego because my father was part of the Grumman crew and they were brought on to help design the F-14 jet fighter plane. And so that job that my father did was something the cult used to recruit my mother because they would oh. say things like, well, look at your husband. He's building a war plane. See the end it's coming. The Right. So they used that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when she finally gave him the ultimatum encouraged by the cult to, you know, it's time you've got, you know, we've got to retreat into the into the woods, you know, for the end times. And my dad was like, no, you know, Mm -hmm. we're, no, we're going to court. Um, Then after she got divorced, they absolutely treated her different because she was a single mother. So So, uh, what an irony, right? Yeah, (laughs) ostracized her from her own husband and then berated her for not having a husband. Yes. And, and who is this Sam Fife? What, what, do we, what do we know about him? How did he kind of find this movement and become, you know, such a powerful figurehead at the, at the kind of top of his, of his own sort of congregation? 
he, um, I, I believe he's an ex-military guy. I, I think he was in the Navy or the Army, one branch he was in. And he started uh, evangelizing in the 1960s where he would be like, you remember, well, we don't remember because we weren't born. But <laughs> if you look at that time, street preachers were really popular. They'd stand on the street with their guitar and sing. So he yeah. started doing that. And then it grew from there. Uh, by 1973, the New York Times, uh, the New York Times, or maybe it was the California paper, um, they're on my website. Uh, he had 43,000 followers already. Wow. So picked up traction pretty quickly. Oh, absolutely. And that was the cult era. So, yeah, people mm-hmm. were flocking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody must have been looking for something in the 70s um, because. It all seems to start around there. I don't, there's a lot of prolific serial killers as well around that time. Well, I don't know what was going on in the world around the 70s. I but. think, well, I have a kind of a hypothesis about mm-hmm. that and that uh, media was really ramping up. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So media was, was huge back then. The Vietnam War had happened. And I think the of world course. in and of itself was very up in arms about that. And mm-hmm. none of us feel the U.S. should have ever been involved in that conflict. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of fear and a lot of anger. And when you have anyone who has fear or anger, that's a malleable mind right yeah. there. I suppose we're getting over the kind of summer of love and and the 60s Mm -hmm. decade and moving sort of more into like punk era and yeah and then it was also still partially the cold war yeah so in america one thing that the cold especially in alaska when they moved us to alaska um was the russians invading us and and they did drills you Mm -hmm. know preparing us basically to die because of communism and they would kill all the Christians and that was part of the political solidification as well. Right. So actually now that we've reflected on it, plenty of reasons for people to be seeking something better than Mm -hmm. the current state of, of the world. Um, and, and what do you think made Sam Fife so attractive to these people? I mean, was it the, beliefs and practices that that he was preaching how how was he different from everybody else he was really charismatic uh he was extremely versed in demonology um all I can say is that you know you're talking mind control and NLP here so you've got like if you look into for instance Doug McClain who was one of Sam's top guys well you know and that's a story that's about to probably break with NPR, but um, Doug McClain has been in and out of trouble, swindling. Uh, he often gets off, for instance, just uh, like in 2006 or seven, he swindled a, a man in Texas of $200,000. He was able to pay it back and wow. the charges dropped. If you look up... Um, Argyle Industries, the the, the United States uh, Exchange Commission versus Stephen Perrone, who is Vince Vaughn's stepfather, and Doug McLean Sr. and his son, who I grew up with at Dry Creek in Alaska. And this case is also on my website. If you click the cult, you can download it. I, I purposely make it downloadable so people can read mm-hmm, these documents. Mm-hmm. Um, they're con men. So they saw all kinds of advantage to, so these upper echelon people are con men. And there's this misconception that everybody who joined the move were these wayward, sad people. No, they were not. Mm -hmm. Some were, yes. Some were, you know, like my mother would be an example of someone who was battling depression and things like that. But there was also accountants, nurses midwives, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people who owned construction companies. Those were the people who got special treatment. They had something to offer the cult. So by the time we went to Alaska, they had contracts with the state of Alaska. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we're talking like this Judean Anglican kind of Pentecostal Jehovah's witness evangelical salad of a belief system. Um, And so by the time they got to Alaska, just to give you an understanding of why 
they chose the interior of Alaska. Yeah. Is that in 1980, Alaska began to pay out pipeline dividends to their uh, residents at the tune of like a thousand dollars a year. Wow. So for Sam Fife to close down the, the, the majority of his compounds in the lower 48, uh, by the time they moved us to Alaska, they had about seven compounds up there. Wow. With so... 200 to 250 people per compound. I re- remember my mother lining up to sign off on her PDF uh, form and lining up to sign off on the checks because you didn't just get it for yourself. So did your children. Right. And the cult took it all. all I was going to ask about fundraising and 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 how money mm-hmm. was made. But I guess that's one one way that money was being raised to support Sam Fife, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then, then the movement itself. Um, yeah, because we worked it ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. Though, I mean, you've already mentioned menial jobs and manual labor, child labor. Um, mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine a four, five, six year old obediently going and picking weeds out of the ground for two hours in the morning before breakfast that to me is like a foreign concept I don't understand what must have been what must have happened to a child for them to willingly go along and and do that that type of thing that's you don't have a choice you're trapped so you just comply uh you go into robotic mode so a lot of those dark spaces I have at where you know I used to be very haunted by them like what's in there Mm -hmm. more abuse more hours of me methodically being forced to work and more abuse and more abuse and more abuse Mm -hmm. so the brain just shuts down and you're going through your life so I don't and I don't look to to fill in those gaps anymore like I don't need to see any more abuse I know what happened in those Mm -hmm. spaces, but Mm -hmm. just to tell you what, you know, the residuals of that, like if you think about a small child being forced and, and this is way different than a child who grows up on the farm and helps his dad out in the fields, right? Way different situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got uh, little children day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year on their hands and knees their joints aren't developing properly. Oh. So by the time I'm seven or eight, by the time I got to Alaska, me and my sister both, and my brother too, we already have body pain, like oh. literal fibromyalgia type body pain, see? Um, so it's just important to me, like by the time I was 18, I was diagnosed with lumbago in my joints. Wow. Oh my so these are the effects of this type of child trafficking and working them like that on their, on their just, my physical body as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what are the beliefs and and practices of this if this movement then what does the average day and week look like for you when you're living sort of in these compounds um well the belief system um they kind of took like a piece of so much we did communion we celebrated a lot of jewish rituals um we did feet washing and, and things like that. So a typical day would be you're up, you're required to go to meals. And if you're not there, it's not like they did a roll call, but they, everybody's watching, right? It's that type of very, you know, uh, uh, you can't trust anybody. So you get up, you go to your meal in where I do not recall going to school, but that doesn't mean I didn't just because I don't recall it. Right. Yeah, I must have had some schooling because I was very smart by the time I got to Alaska and I could read at a very high level. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming I was allowed to read books in where before I was seven, but I don't recall that. Uh, I recall a lot of working, a lot of working. My brother as well. My sister too remembers being in the kitchen. We just worked and we went back for lunch uh, where we all ate silently because at meals they played sound five preaching right so you're sitting there eating and listening to him violently preach right back to work in the afternoon dinner service at night 
um, at where I even remember like they disrupted our sleep. So we'd have to pray in the middle of the night. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I feel like where and farms like that were like the dissection phase. Once they have you dissected, right? They move you to Alaska. You're already programmed into this robotic slave. Okay. And you move, you move to Alaska at the age of, of seven or eight. Yes. And I just want to say, um, going back between the ages of three and seven, mm-hmm. they believed that exorcism was the answer to everything oh, gosh, from okay. laughing because you're a kid with a demon of silliness to epilepsy, to down syndrome, to diabetes, anything, pedophilia, anything. It was all a demon. And all you needed to do was just come to one of the deliverance farms and we will cure you. Um, and exorcisms were violent, head beating, oh, many people gosh. around you slapping, pinching, hair pulling, screaming, spitting in your face. Um, Kara Cobb, who is the daughter-in-law of the man who took over the coal after Sam Five died, she wrote a book and in the book is a photo of a boy about to go through an exorcism. And you can see Kara and another leader like dancing because they would square dance and do all this weird crap. Like it was like bringing the energy into a frenzy. And the look on that boy's face is so sad. He's just his brows are furrowed. So that was the disconnection of the adults to the children Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you're dancing and praising God and speaking in tongues, you know, celebrating that you're about to abuse this child. That's absolutely terrible. So I had head trauma. I'm sure by the time I was, you know, had left where because they yeah. they slap you so hard in the head it just rocks your head to the side back and forth oh. so very very violent my brother too had shared with me about they killed all the animals kosher okay yeah so at nine years old here we come from the city of San Diego living in the suburbs in this nice house with our daddy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now he's out in the pig pens being taught how to like have oh. a knife in a pig's throat to let oh. it bleed out. Sorry to be so raw, but no, you see no. the trauma. That's and like, my brother said that for years he couldn't get that squealing out of his head. Yeah, absolutely. At that age, kids are supposed to be visiting petting zoos and and Mm -hmm. and wildlife parks and being excited about different animals that they come into contact with not being exposed Mm -hmm. to things like that that's that's absolutely awful and and it's even more awful because they raise those animals yeah yeah so they slop you know they feed them the slop hog they yes so you cannot be in that position and not have a little bit if you are any type of Uh, most Mm -hmm. you know have empathy to not be a children bond with animals so that made it even worse he said was that like he tried really hard like never to name a pig or never to uh, bond with the animals and and then you all moved to Alaska on Sam Five's order and he moves over there with you all no sam five stayed living in his nice little house in miami right okay so that's why you you listen to him doing sermons instead of him Mm -hmm. he would come occasionally right right so when sam five and the father ministry were coming the cult compound was a bustle the best foods were cooked everything was being cleaned up it was like the royal family was about to arrive uh, it was a very big deal. And then they'd be there for two or three days and they'd probably like stay at an elder's cabin or something. And then off they'd go to the next compound. Right. So that's how they rolled. But yeah, no, he stayed living in his city house with the pool and, you know, all those nice amenities that come from taking everyone's money. Yeah. Just raking in the cash while everybody moves mm-hmm. up to, you know, the really cold part of the world. Mm-hmm. And do you remember much about about the move itself, how different it was from, from what you were used to? Well, yeah. I mean, I 
came from, you know, being with my father and, and being in the city to well, when, when we got to Alaska. So just so you understand, Sam five sent up tons of families because you could still homestead land. So you just go stake it, go register it. You homestead this land. Right. Then that land was sold to Doug McLean and George Harris, who quit claim deeded it back and forth to each other for like 10 bucks for years. So um, there was no running water, no electricity oh, in, in Alaska. Okay. So you're in the interior of Alaska, an hour and a half south of Delta Junction, which is an hour and a half south of the city of Fairbanks. So you're really two and a half hours south of right. any major metropolis. Mm-hmm. Okay. Way back in the woods. So to even get on the road, you got to go an hour and a half and then you got another mile to go on the road into the compound. And back then it was a hairy, scary drive because depending on the season, you'd have to get out and move logs out of the road. And wow. it was truly like they threw us back into the 1800s. And um, so we lived in a tent when we first got to Alaska because all of the cabins oh weren't built yet. Gosh. And then before winter hit, they moved uh, us, some of us families who hadn't gotten a cabin yet up to the top of the tabernacle where they had um, these rooms walled off, but the walls didn't go all the way up to the top. There was a little bit of a space. So there was a few families up there um, and an old man who, you know, got his hands on me as well. Um, so that's what, and the only building that did have electricity was the tabernacle and it was ran by a generator. Right. And then they had a ham radio and they had a phone because my father would call there too. And again, Mm -hmm. I do not remember one phone call with my father. Like I can't bring it to my memory, but my brother, my sister can. Right. Right. So you're literally in the sticks in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Having to what build, build Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. Well, um, so I'll go into this they assigned you to certain jobs. Like, of course, my brother, they had a contract. They had contracted already with the state of Alaska to work on building the Alaska Mm -hmm. pipeline. And so my brother remembers just going to work at 14 and 15 instead of going to school. Yeah. Okay. So total violation of child Mm -hmm. labor laws, a hundred percent. And the state of Alaska knew it. Um, so they were already working right away. And then women went to the kitchen and the fields and the greenhouse. Uh, so, um, when I first got there, I remember having just a little, it was freedom, first of all, in comparison mm-hmm. to where, cause I'm back with my family. I'm like, so excited to be back with yeah. my sister. Cause I just looked up to her so much. So I remember a little period of time where I got to hang out in the tent and a girl slipped me some books. And I got to read the books. Um, But then, you know, I get molested in the tent by an older teenage boy. Like you weren't Mm. safe anywhere, nowhere. Um, And so from there, they moved us to the top of the tabernacle. And then like a year or so later, there was a cabin ready and we moved there. But everything was uh, kerosene lanterns. We had chamber pots, um, pot belly stoves in our cabins. Um, And that's how we lived. Uh, We even had makeshift showers. So we sponge bathed between shower schedules. Um, You know, uh, everything was very regimented for us. Like um, boys were required to keep their hair short, not touch their collar. Okay. Girls always had to be in skirts that were like mid calf length. In the right. cold weather, we were allowed to wear pants beneath the skirt, but we right. could never just wear pants. Right. Uh, we couldn't wear shirts that were revealing, no makeup. Mm-hmm. I remember wearing bonnets a lot in the fields because of the heat. Or, yeah. Um, all clothing was put into like this clothing bank. So anytime you went to a compound and you were new, everything you brought in was taken by the cold put in this clothing bank and redistributed. Wow. Okay. So, so you'd, you'd see the someone cl- the next day and be like, that's my t-shirt. You could. Yeah. 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 Or you're betting like they gave you a list wow. of things to buy 
And then a list of, and I have that list in my book of it's extensive. It's just like incredible. The list that you had to buy to even come into the cult. Those are the things you kept. And then you were encouraged to like, get rid of everything except for pots and pans, bedding, clothes. You couldn't bring books or anything like that. And you were told to bring this list of extensive things with, with, you know, and, and the, the, the cult's forethought would be to distribute what you mm-hmm. brought immediately. And that, that was, that was their whole kind of plan. Yeah, there was one list of things you had to buy to be prepared to live in these really rugged and very vicious, you know, uh, environment, right? Mm -hmm. So no, Mm -hmm. it gets down to 40, 50 below, you're in the wilderness. And then they encouraged you to bring things that could be distributed. So like when we went to where my mother drove a U-Haul full of stuff. Right. And my, right. So by that time, our stuff, you know, by the time we get to Alaska, we're just shopping out of the clothing bank, you know, yeah, just shopping. Yeah. I don't know the right word because we weren't paying for it, but that's how we got everything that, you know, was in the cabin. Like I remember mm-hmm. my mom found, mm-hmm. a, you know, sheets and, and, and stuff like that, that we could hang up in the loft where my sister and I could make a severance of a little room. And I, I write this out in cold child as well, mm-hmm. where people mm-hmm. can kind of get more of a feel, but yeah, definitely a very, uh, just like you know it just took us back to being like puritans again mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you mentioned that there were some restrictions sort of with your clothing and and sort of aesthetically mm-hmm. what was expected of, of men and women um w- were there any other restrictions in place with things like dieting or sleep well because we grew our own food, I have to say the food in and of itself was very healthy, mm-hmm. very organic, uh, but food was used to control you. So uh, for instance, we couldn't have food in our rooms, in our cabin. Like there was no snacking at night. You didn't have anything. Right. Because you right. couldn't go out shopping. Yeah. I remember my brother said the first time he ran away when an Alaska state trooper picked him and another boy up took him straight to one of the other compounds who transferred him back to dry Creek in Alaska. And when he came back, the rule was that you had to go live with an elder. You weren't allowed to speak to anyone. You were openly shunned because you've been out in the world and been tainted by the secular world. So that has to be cleansed from you before you're allowed to reintegrate. Okay. And he said he was shocked when he went into this cabin and they had food. He was like, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> well, where did how, this where come from? Food? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the worst punishment you could have as far as food was to screw up in the afternoon and then get your dinner taken away from you where you had to sit at the table oh. in front of 200 other people with your hands folded. So everybody knew you did something wrong. Oh. So you got public humiliation going. You get no dinner. You're not going to get any more food until breakfast. So that's the worst meal to have taken from you as a punishment. Mm -hmm, And, mm -hmm. you know, eyes were always watching. And then you have these sadistic people who are literally looking for something, hoping you screw up so that they can punish you. Like the moves, theology and system attracted abusers. It Mm -hmm. was the best place for abusers to go. Because then they could just abuse and say it's fine because that's what my religion teaches hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And justify it with, you know, scripture and verses like you mentioned before, mm-hmm. you know, everything was justifiable yeah. through the, the lines of the Bible. Right. And what did your education look like when you moved to Alaska? Does it does it did you have any memory of any formal type of education? Yeah, we did go to school in Alaska. We had a little schoolhouse and then above it is where like all the single was the single men's dorm. Um, but that was very, um, censored. So we had basic reading, writing, arithmetic, and a few little aspects of science. Most of our, uh, focus was on religious studies. So I had like read the Bible about four times cover to cover by the time I was 14, they would make us memorize things like the baguettes, you know, this person beget this person beget this person. And that was, that's mm-hmm. a terrible thing to have to memorize um, and then recite. 
uh, and and you're you're trying to recite, and if you mess up, you might get a swat, you know. So you're already nervous. Yeah, um, yeah. So they did that. Like I didn't. Here's an example. I did not know about slavery in America until I went to college and took American wow. history. So they did not teach us any of that history about America. It was we moved here. Uh, we did celebrate Thanksgiving. We didn't celebrate any other holidays. You couldn't celebrate your birthday. It was considered right. eating the flesh, right? Right. But we did celebrate Thanksgiving. And I do remember like coloring the little pictures of the, the colonials sitting with the First Nations people and they're all happy together. They did that to, uh, so I didn't know what happened to like, I would later find out like my grandmother's uh, almost full-blooded Cherokee Indian or middle wow, name okay. Echo. And I wouldn't find out that's how I got green eyes and what happened to them and the trail. None of that was, you know, the trail of tears. None of that was taught to us. None of it. So I knew nothing about the civil war, nothing about like the Boston tea party, none of that. So when you took American history, there was, lots of colorful material for you to kind of sink your teeth into. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I was mind blown, you know, and I'll, I'm writing about this in uh, my sequel is that I had a lot of questions, but you know, nobody explains things to you. Like no. I remember the first time I heard a racial slur and I asked my grandmother, what what does that word mean? I knew it was a racial slur because it was said by a white person to a person of color in an argument, right? So my mind could deduct. Right. Yeah. They said something towards the color of their skin. And my grandmother didn't explain a thing to me. All she said was, don't you ever say that word. Yes. Just never say it. And that was it. I was like, you know, but I didn't understand why. And I didn't have, of course, the internet or anything mm -hmm. in the 80s mm -hmm. to go looking for that information or, or, um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's how it was, you know, and my mom stayed pretty authoritarian. So I didn't get a lot explained to me. No, I suppose after a while of asking questions and not getting any answers, you just don't bother to ask the questions in the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I did a lot of faking it till I made it in high yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. I've spoken to a lot of, um, a lot of people sort of, um, in the Pentecostal episodes that I've done and the Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. episodes where people are um, kind of sheltered from, I always say wildly is the, is the quote unquote wildly um, things mm -hmm. like television and pop culture. And, right. and then they, they, their school friends will be having conversations about the new album by Green Day that they bought on the weekend. And they're like, by what, who, where, what, what, what's yeah. it, what? Yeah. So I, I, I can't even relate. In to, a way, you know. I kind of feel like that's a, even a worse way to grow up. Because like, when I think about that, and I really relate to Jehovah's Witness people a lot, like I relate to them and, and their beliefs. And I, and my grandmother was Pentecostal, right? So I didn't have any knowledge of that. So in a way, that ignorance was bliss. Mm -hmm. But to have to be exposed to it and denied it, that's horrible. A quick message from this week's sponsor. Paranormal horror author Eve S. Evans introduces a brand new spine chilling release, True Ghost Stories of First Responders, available on Amazon today. First responders with any real time on the job believe in ghosts. They've experienced events they can't otherwise explain. Same with other professions that deal with injuries, accidents or death. Police officers, firemen, 911 operators. They've seen the worst that people can do to one another and they've all had brushes with the unexplained. Don't believe in ghosts? This book might change your mind and steal any hope of sleep. These stories are unexplainable. True accounts from first responders, police officers, firemen and 911 operators told from the perspective of everyday people. Every single tale between these covers is 100% true. Think you can explain them? 
we dare you to try. If you delight in ghostly books and material, feel free to also check out Eve's podcast, Bone Chilling Tales to Keep You Awake, for weekly true paranormal creepy stories, available on Apple and all major podcasting networks, and is also available on YouTube as a narrated and animated experience. Yeah, yeah, I remember one. To one, sit in a classroom and not get to eat a cupcake because it's someone's birthday. That's I know. horrible. Or having to sit down and not say, like, not say the Pledge of Allegiance when the rest of the class are standing up saying it. And then everyone's yeah, like, you're like, yeah. why are you so yes. different? Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, those kind yeah, of ostracizing experiences are um, always, always difficult to to, to to listen to. Yeah, we did not say the Pledge of Allegiance. I never learned that. Look in your home, look in your office, look in your home office. Everywhere you turn, there's so much smart. At Capella University, we think education should be smart too. Our game-changing FlexPath format puts you in control of your master's degree so you can learn how, when, and where you want. Smart, huh? Yeah, we think so too. So if you want to take the next step in your career, make Capella your first step. Visit capella.edu to learn more. Capella University. Don't just learn, learn smarter. That. Uh, we didn't do any of that. We did. I do remember praying for Carter. So it's very Republican based cold. Right. Yeah. So we always like would really hold up, you know, conservative uh, politicians in prayer a lot. Which is which is strange because I know a lot of religious movements don't are encouraged not to go and vote, you know, because they separate church and state. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's interesting. Well, this cult. Well, I'll tell you, this cult has integrated themselves into a, the state of Alaska's political system. So there's a senator named Shelley Hughes, who was part of one of the cult compounds called Whitestone. Uh, this last year, another one of the cult members, they run for the small district and then move up, right. move up, move up. So yeah. they've integrated themselves to politics so that they can control things. And it's yeah. it's working. Sounds a little bit like the um, Wild Wild Country documentary. Yeah. Or what they mm-hmm. were trying to achieve in that documentary. You know, that I found out about that. I, I, I Before that documentary came out, I was right. I wrote about that in my book because when I got out of the cult, I remember that had happened in like 83. So it yeah. was still big in the news. And I was just like, oh, and then the movie Red Dawn, you know, the communists come. And, and I was yeah, like, it's yeah. real. It's so real. Everything Brother Sam and them said, like, they were right you know it just yeah, freaked yeah. me out um, and what about I when everything really... happened with Jim Jones in Guyana did that did that do anything to 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 kind of raise any red flags because I know that that was mentioned in the wild wild country episode uh where they're all being compared to to Jim Jones and the people's temple and 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 Jones Town. well my mom told me one time that she got invited to go and hear him like like that's how close she maybe was to wow. going that route because they were all in California. Yeah. And Jim Jones was another dynamic one. Um, yeah. I never see, I didn't have critical, I didn't have like the ability to cognitively piece things together then. Yeah. 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 I just, um, you look at something like that and go, Oh my God, that's horrible. But you don't think in your head, Oh, that could have been me. No, like it doesn't, it's not, not there. Cause between 14 and probably well into my 30s I had memory yes but you just shut it you know um traumatic amnesia is a powerful thing and sometimes I I believe for myself it was like a willing amnesia in that I am not going to think about that I am not going to look at it if I don't think about it it doesn't exist Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you just kind of shove it away because it's it's horrible and this this school that you're attending is it is it on the compound or is it actually yes right okay so it's not like attending mm-hmm. public school we were only taken off the cult compound i mean this is a deeper part of my story uh we were taken to the military base a lot uh, my sister and i have some memories of being driven in a white van up into the mountains and some things like that. So the only time you we were taken off the coal 
that I can remember. And then when we were taken to Fort Greeley, I don't remember much of what happened after that. So I'm not sure why we were taken there. And then, okay, so in 1979, Sam Five, who's the seasoned pilot, is flying out of, I think, Guatemala. And it's very foggy. And the air controller says to him, you know, you need to go right. Instead, he goes left into the side of the mountain, crash, boom, everybody in the plane dies. Whoa. Okay. So um, he had always preached that when he died, it was the end of the world. That was the sign that Jesus right. was returning. So I remember like, you know, dissension and confusion and wait, what, what? And then Buddy caught swooped in within 30 days from compound to compound with all the father ministry and just got everybody back under control. You know, they just changed the date. <laughs> God gave me this word and I'm here to, you know, and all the people were like, Oh, okay. So God's right. changed, changed the plan, mm -hmm. but things changed slightly when Buddy Cobb took over um, where they started to be a little bit more lax, like an example right. would be, you could take your meal back to your cabin. Right. My right. mom could now send a list to get like little snacks and stuff from the store. And Doug McLean's mother sent me for braces. Oh, I will okay. never understand that. In my book, you can read about how Doug McLean's baby died from faith healing. This little infant oh, was like three, four days old, no. dehydrated, should have been taken to the doctor. Oh, gosh. And so I cannot deduct in my head why the grandmother of that infant would have paid for me to go have braces, but not encouraged her son to take this baby yeah. to the doctor. It oh. doesn't make sense. It's weird. It's weird to me. That's I just mean, always been so odd, you know. Was was there a difference between Sam Fife being alive and dead between those two different events? Yes, because yes. maybe maybe there was mm -hmm. no way Sam Fife would have approved of the baby receiving medical care above faith healing. Yes, and I have considered that, and I've considered that since that was after Sam Five died too. You know how she always stayed very close to me. She they were in wear yeah. as well, and um, she, and she is like one of the very few people that I remember being really kind. Right, right, yeah. Um, yeah. but she seemed to take a certain liking to me, and I also have wondered like. Was that a piece of redemption, kind of like I'm going to do this kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she obviously had access to money that uh, that other people did not. And mm -hmm. just to throw it out there, her husband was one of the three men who also bought the Ware compound, right? Land, okay. And so then she, sold yeah, it. So they're all very decide. interwoven yeah. with starting this cult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's just, yeah, little oddities like that, that you try to kind of reason in your head, or you just get into acceptance, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't get closure on everything. And how does your time change as, as things move along in Alaska? I mean, you're getting older. So is the attention, mm -hmm. like, is, is, is the attention from boys kind of ramping up and and things like that um because you you've mentioned some some different types of abuse that you experienced as a young child and I'm just wondering if it it kind of eases off or gets worse as you get older I don't remember attention from boys as in I like you right. not like right um the only attention from boys I ever got was being you know harmed mm -hmm. um I also was a loud child because I was born deaf in my right ear okay and so I was often pegged as being boisterous okay but I didn't know like like I didn't know even like realize I was deaf I know that's kind of hard to understand but Nobody, my mom never said to me like, oh, you don't have any hearing. Like no one reasoned that. Oh, that's right. why she's loud. She can't hear her own volume. I couldn't reason it. I, you just were always in trouble, you know? And the way that they worked out relationships with boys and girls is that 
you had to walk out a year with a chaperone to even come into a place of being able to get into a relationship where the chaperone stood at a distance and you spent non-intimate time together. So there was no inter dating allowed as far as teenagers not that they wouldn't probably you know like my brothers told me stories about sneaking off with certain girls into the hay piles and like making out yeah and stuff yeah. like that but there was no open dating as a teenager allowed right right and how how did recruitment into the into the movement work is, is it just sort of through word of mouth spread in or are people sent out to proselytize how how does how does it work in terms of getting more people to join well you know recruitment like it works like like any cult recruits right so into their church so their their bible study they're looking for these like uh, worker bees their worker bees are going to be people who are broken Mm -hmm. you know maybe Mm -hmm. have unhealed trauma and wounding um You know, like in Delta Junctions, the coal owns almost all the rental homes there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they'll recruit people like, hey, come work for us. We'll put you in one of our rental homes. It'll be perfect for you. But the money's going in a circle because you're working for the coal and then you're paying them rent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the money's going back to them. And so recruitment is always this promise, right? Depending on who you are. So if you're someone who's struggling and in need in your life, it might be like as little as, you know what, we have a thriving Christian community. It's filled with love. You won't want for anything. Your worth will be valued, Um, which is really like interpreted as, you know, come live on our farm and work yourself to exhaustion. And that's what your worth is. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. um, someone who might be like keener may need another angle, like a business proposition and an advantage. Uh, if someone's really religious, the cult might use the angle of the end times like they did with my mother, where they worked her into such a fear frenzy that the end of the world was coming. Mm-hmm. She was absolutely convinced she'd be safe in the woods, right? Right. So yeah. they are well versed in NLP and mirroring, and yeah. that allows them to shape shift their personalities as they mirror their victim for recruitment. And and by the time you get to Alaska, you mentioned there was around 250 people that lived in this one compound. Uh, yeah, I would say that that there was about 200 to 250 people there. Wow. OK. OK. And you you stayed here for how long before you moved on again? Uh, I was in uh, where for four years and I was in Alaska for seven. Right. OK. So you're around okay. 14. Yes. And, and then where, I don't want to spoil alert the ending of my book, but I will okay. say this. Okay. Um, a pretty major event happened with my sister. Okay. And that ultimately is how we left. Okay. Okay. I was okay. gonna. I was gonna say you haven't mentioned your sister as much as your brother, but I didn't know if that was a topic that was sort of off limits for you or no. My sister was very um, quiet very docile Mm -hmm. she did what she was told she was you know my sister was like my shining star because my brother ran away when he was 15 he ran away twice first time they brought him back second time he was successful okay and he made it into Fairbanks and sat on the back of a police car because he was scared to go into the cop uh into the police office and this cop came out and said you know what's up buddy And he told them, I just ran away from this farm. My sisters are there. Like, please, you know, like, if you take me back, like, he, and they never checked on us. They just took my brother to foster care. Wow. So that left me and my sister, you know, we were, like, so close. We always were close. We were close even after the cold. Okay. Um, It's just, she, she just was a good kid. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I was the most defiant one me and my brother but my sister was the opposite she's always been the opposite more quiet and docile and kind of just stay out of the way you know if I stay out of the way I won't get in trouble yeah where I was a little bit more defiant so 
being back with my sister, I write about this a lot in my book. It was like, she would do little things like rub the inside of my arm to put me to sleep at night. Oh. Like she was a loving and protective big sister. Yeah. I cannot imagine what it was like for her and where. I mean, she remembers, a little, it's, it's heartbreaking. Imagine being, looking at your little sister and not being able to help her. Yeah, yeah, so especially when you're both experiencing yeah. the same types mm-hmm. of abuse as well. And and your little sister is looking at, we could talk with our eyes at where like nothing else. So I, I write about this too. She would nod her head to me, like, don't look at me, eat. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Don't look at me, shut corn. So she would, we would catch eye contact you know, the most, because yeah. I was never around my brother, because they didn't intermix the boys and girls a lot. Right, right. Um, but yeah, you know, my sister, it's just sad. It's just heartbreaking. I mean, she's doing great. She's married. She's been married for 25 years. She lives in Texas. She has a wonderful life now. Mm-hmm. Um, but to think back on on that from her perspective, it's, it's very, very sad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She, she told me, I'll tell you this, that she could recognize my cry upstairs and where she always knew when it was me crying. Oh, that's deep. That's just, uh, yeah. Especially when she can't go to you and do anything to, mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. she remembers me screaming for my mother. Oh gosh. Uh, It's very terrible. That sounds absolutely heartbreaking. Oh my goodness. Horrific. And, and you, you said you didn't want to, you didn't want to spoil the end of your book by, by explaining to everybody how you kind of got out of the movement. Um, But can you tell us what, what age you were roughly? Sure. Yeah, I was 14. So uh, we ended up going down to Tennessee because that's where my grandmother lived. Right. Only family that my mother had contact with. Right. Um, So I went from this no electricity to this little, really segregated college town. um, Right close to Memphis on the, on the Western side of Tennessee. Um, yeah. So I finished about three months of my eighth grade year in public school. Wow. Okay. This second book, I just want people to know, like Colt child's going to break your heart, but the second one's probably going to make you laugh a lot because I had, you know, like, here's an example of how naive I was Mm -hmm. trying to fit in. I'm hearing this kid, talk about a John Cougar Mellencamp and I'm like I know those kind of cougars like literally in my head I'm like Mm -hmm, oh they're talking mm -hmm. about cougars so I'll just act like I know and then they look at me like what are you talking about do you not know who John Cougar Mellencamp is and I'm like oh gosh I thought you guys were talking about cougars so I'm faking it till I make it yeah yeah, every little thing like that my story was my dad was in the military. My mom and dad got divorced. That's how I ended up here. That was yeah. it. That was yeah. mine and my sister's story. So then you had to try to smooth over these moments so that you didn't have to explain why you don't know, why you don't know you don't eat the, the tail of a piece of shrimp. Yep. Yep. At 14 years old, 15 years old. See, those are, always those are like over these pinnacle times in, 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 in life as well, aren't they? Where you, mm-hmm. where yeah. everything changes and, you're you're growing and you're becoming independent and your hormones are raging and and you're like I'm a I'm and gonna... you don't know how to count change yeah and you don't know how and and mm-hmm. you think you're really mature and grown up <laughs> that you know right, everything right and you go yeah. through these these experiences for the first time that must be absolutely what a readjustment that must be from mm-hmm. from there's from... complete culture shock mm-hmm mm-hmm and but, but, but kind of in a, like, like I'll write about this too. Like, um, here's another thing I did. I finally got to go get jeans, but my mom could only afford two pairs. Well, me, I'm girly girl. I want the ones with the little glitter on them, not realizing that that was going to let the kids at school know I was wearing the same jeans two, three days in a row. See, so there's just all those little things that my mom didn't guide me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that yeah. end up getting you still bullied but then on the other side of that is this freedom like I read the little Ingle, uh, you know the little house on the prairie books 
till they were dog-eared on the coal. <laughs> and I get off the coal and my grandma's like, well, you know, there's a show. Oh, oh, to oh, get to sit for wow. hours and yeah. watch Little House on the Prairie and I'm weeping. It's so real to me, you know? Oh, wow. Um, so there's like the kind of fun side of getting to discover media and television yeah, and yeah, all of these yeah. other things too, so. And you mentioned that your your grandmother was a practicing Pentecostal so Mm -hmm. did your faith transfer over to to sort of what your grandmother was practicing or did you leave religion in Alaska well when we first moved there my mom had bought a trailer and she my grandma had a farm and she had put the trailer on the farm and my my grandmother was one of those you know you live here you go to church right yep so church was every Sunday um and it wasn't that different I mean again it was kind of more freedom right because you got to go to like the youth part of it and I got to meet other kids yeah but the worship and all of that and the speaking in tongues and the clapping and all of that was no different than the cult so the religion itself was to me in my mind like a little lighter Mm mm-hmm Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it was familiar, not abnormal, but like, oh, you know, this is the same, but this is just a little bit more freedom. But the same teachings, we did communion. You know, I don't remember feet washing at that church. I do remember communion, but all those same things like testimonies, um, visions. Yeah. You know, none of that really changed. And my mom remained a Christian, but she turned into like this walking oxymoron where she'd like cuss you out holding the Bible like that. (laughs) So this part of her that was real, probably like her real authentic identity that was just like bold and yeah would seep out, you know, but that programming, that religious programming stayed covering it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about your father? Did you manage to kind of of get back a, a physical sort of seeing him in, in, in person and, and some kind of relationship with him? Well, I reckon it's, it was kind of interesting, you know, we all had really severe Stockholm syndrome. And so we ended up being very protective of our mother until she passed away in 2007. Mm -hmm. So I was very angry at my father and I believed everything my mom told me that he didn't want us, that he never cared about us, that he never paid child support all lies, all lies. I, I would come to find out my father fought for us for like five years in court. Wow, and the yeah. reason why the court gave us to my mom is one, because it was the seventies and my father was working on special projects. So one of the problems was who's going to care for your kids when you're yeah. locked down at Miramar yeah. for six weeks. So that's and- how my mother got us, but my dad fought. Yeah. I was going to say after she died, I was like, I can write my book now. I mm-hmm. don't know what kept me from writing it before. You know, I had a time of regret. I was like, oh, you should have pegged her on these questions. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's what reconnected me with my father. I was just like, I have to call him. I have to call my dad and get these answers. Wow. And what was your your siblings' reaction to finding out that the well. My sister had already uh, redeveloped a relationship with him and would okay. encourage me. And I would be like, I'm not calling him. Why are you? Yeah. Talking? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so she was very happy. And my brother was happy because we got to find out, you know, my dad's side of the story. And I you know he's aging. He's well into his eighties and mm-hmm. um, is remarried and lives in Ohio. And we email and talk occasionally, you know? So yeah, it was, The first time I talked to my dad, it was like a four hour phone call and we both cried. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I was his baby. And I remember before the call, like, I remember moments with my father and I remember how proud he was of me. So I was a very bright little, little, Mm -hmm. you know, toddler. Um, So the moment he heard my voice, he was like, oh, my baby girl. And we Mm -hmm. just cried. I mean, it was just, you know, yeah, I was just sad. I feel mostly just so heartbroken for him. He missed all of those years. Absolutely, and he fought, he yeah. fought himself into bankruptcy fighting for us in the court. Oh. That's how powerful this cult was. Yeah, I mean, they but, paid. Did he? Did he read your book at all? Do you know? I I don't know. I did send it to him, but I've never asked him because it's just. 
I don't, you know, it might be too I don't difficult. Care. Yeah. yeah. Like my sons have not read it and I kind of don't want them to. Yeah. yeah. Like they don't need to know all that. It's, it's a rough book. It's really traumatic. They know I yeah. had a traumatic childhood, but do they, I mean, if they chose to fine, you know, of course they're grown, they can do what they want, but yeah, it's just not something I force at my family. Cause it's like really close to home. Mm-hmm. And that might be some really, he may have read it, but I just don't ask him about it. Cause it's really heartbreaking. I mean, yeah. every time we talked about it, you know, my dad would cry because how helpless are you as a father mm-hmm. that you can't get your kids and you know, they're not in a good space. Yeah. Yeah. And no one will help you. And it's interesting that what your mum did to you in regards to your father is basically what the movement did to her before mm-hmm. they divorced. So mm-hmm. she's almost used the same tactics of, of, breaking down that relationship with your father that that the Mm -hmm. movement did to her to get her to join the group in the first place Mm -hmm. yeah the triangulation my mother was like an expert triangulator to the day she died she Mm -hmm. had it down pat you know the move really solidifies that behavior do you think she picked that up being a part of the of the movement or do you think that that she had some of that book before already well my brother and sister remember before I was born, my mom was wild. Like she had a belly dancer friend. She loved to go to party. She was at a party <laughs> when her water broke with my brother. Wow. She's very social. So I'm going to say no. Like even my sister remembers, cause I was a twin and the other twin was stillborn. But oh like my gosh. sister remembers, you know, my mom introducing her to me and bringing her to the bassinet and saying, do you want to see a little angel? And looking at me and like, she remembers that she was like, I never, you know, she'd never seen a little infant like that. And that was ours. So no, my mom was like super loving and, and no, they turned her definitely. And you've mentioned that one of the tactics that's used quite often within this movement is NLP. And and you've used that acronym quite a few times. And I just wondered if you wanted to talk the listeners through what NLP is and the types of, um, I I only know about it from watching the Nexium documentary Seduced. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that they use that quite a lot in that movement as well. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you wanted to give a little explanation. Sure. Well, um, you know, NLP is neuro linguistic programming. So it's the use of language to um, uh, manipulate someone. So there's a good side and a bad side to that. We can use uh, neuro linguistic programming to help our brains move into a more positive thought pattern, for instance. That's a positive use of NLP, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Their use of it is to mirror you, as a narcissist says and use this linguistic language to program your mind. And that's what they did. So there's a lot of like little phrases they have and little code things like, like if they ever sent out a message to close ranks, for instance, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that meant go quiet, get into prayer. Um, so I love the study of neurolinguistics and words and meanings of words. I'll give you an example. I refuse to use the word cult Mm -hmm. in any other way than it's defined in the dictionary. Yeah. And how it's defined in the dictionary is simply to worship. It was coined by the Catholics in the 1600s and it simply meant to worship. Well, that word was morphed and changed over time. And I feel like that's a part of neuro-linguistic programming. Like, why are you doing that? Well, that's to normalize certain parts of religion and go, this religion's okay but this one's a cult. I don't believe like that. I believe the original meaning of the word that if you worship, you're a part of a cult or you're exuding cult behavior. Yeah. And maybe the question is, is it a bad cult or a good cult? Okay. Um, So I do not quantify, for instance, I don't look at Nexium as a cult. I look at it as a pyramid scheme with a swindler who did some horrible things to Mm -hmm. women. But I don't look at it as as a cult because who were they worshiping? They weren't worshiping anyone. 
but themselves really like that was the goal was Mm, mm self-development. So to me, you know, I have a little bit of a different perspective. I majored in English too in college. That's what I got my degree in. So I'm very into language and words and really using them. Like, you know how people will like, for instance, use the Illuminati to talk about this horrible, like sex of the world. That's not what Illuminati means. It means to shine and be light. So how can you be a bad person? and shine and be light. So I really wish that people would get into like understanding the meaning of words and how they're used against you. If you don't know what these words mean. And so I'm very into NLP and, and people being educated about it and being very aware of what's being said to you, how it's being said, and how do you emotionally feel about what is being said to you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that actually following that, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I, when I first heard about it, I was thinking that's really scary. And I wonder if I've ever been in a position where that might have been used on me and I haven't even Mm -hmm. been aware that it's happened. Absolutely. Um, Have you ever gone into a store where a salesperson was like, oh, this will look great on you. Or you've been, it's used in sales. When I was in the corporate world, they sent us to seminars to learn sales NLP. So it's taught, I was taught mirroring, how to mirror someone to to sell to them. So it's used in all of these. So yeah, we've all been, been, you know, had NLP thrown at us. Yeah, yeah, it it, it, is. The news uses it. Um, It is a very scary thought. It's why I'm very into, um, I do not have cable. I have not had cable for 15 years. I do not watch the news. I choose very carefully what I do put my brain into. Um, so I'm very protective of my mind, even music mm-hmm. and all of that, because undue influence is very subtle. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And absolutely. if you're not aware, you can find yourself suddenly believing a certain way and not even realizing how you got there. Yep. Yep. And that's why um, sometimes my if my partner finds, you know, motivational speakers that he listens to on, on YouTube and places like that, he'll always, <laughs> he'll always come and say to me, mm-hmm. does this person sound like cold tea to you? You would tell me, wouldn't you, if you mm-hmm. thought I was listening to something that might make me change the way I think and feel about things. And I'm always like, I'm, right. not, I'm not an expert. I can't. Well, I think it's important to remember that everyone, motivate you know now I don't think everyone's bad there's great people out there who love and do good things for people right Mm -hmm. but the swindlers there's always a little bit of truth that's going to make you go I relate yeah mixed in with their bs like horoscopes yeah you know I just encourage people like why are you looking towards other people to teach you how to love yourself why I don't listen to motivational speakers and try no I'm more apt to go quiet, close down all outside influences, get out some paper and start writing your emotions and get to know yourself and Mm -hmm. quit looking to other people to guide you. Our DNA is brilliant. We are brilliantly scientifically designed. Um, Anybody who wants to understand genomics, should go look up Hudson Alpha Institute of Biotechnology and go to YouTube and spend hours watching their videos and learn what your cells and what your DNA and brain actually is capable of. Mm -hmm. When you get to know yourself and start to speak to your own selves, you realize that there's the universes inside of us we're not tapping into because we're so encouraged to put our mind into things outside of ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think, I think that's a very wise thing to say, and and a, and a, and, a, and a good perspective on things that that I hadn't maybe considered, um, and that leads me actually really nicely onto my next point, which is, what advice would you give to others who are looking to leave their own high controlling environment? Gosh, um, you know, I just read this quote and posted it. I have a Survivor Voices Instagram and it said, um, it's okay to grieve making a good decision. Oh, that hit me in my face. Like, wow, (laughs) because 
making a good decision for yourself, especially when you're leading a cult, comes with so much loss. It's horrible. Your family might shun you. Your partner may go, you ain't taking the kids. You know, there's so much fear. Um, and so um, I just say, be ready for it. Like, don't, don't have a fantasy in your mind of what you think life is going to be like. It's, it's so difficult. Um, mm -hmm. so there's this na uh, first nation saying, I also love too." that says when the grandparent heals, they heal their children's children. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's important too, like the way to break generational trauma. So for someone leaving, I just say, don't be afraid to reach out. We are out here waiting to support mm -hmm. you. Absolutely. There yeah. are hundreds of us in groups who will wrap you up in our loving arms and let you cry because leaving a cult is never easy. It comes with loss of friends, with learning a new way, with questioning yourself and your doctrine and deconstructing. It's deep. And so just be patient. Don't let anybody put a measure on your healing time. Like it's okay to set your boundaries and heal in your own time as it feels safe and comfortable for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's fantastic. Um, I don't know if you've accessed any type of, of therapy that you could recommend to anybody at all. Well, I did have a psychologist for a long time before COVID and I loved her. And I have to say, we did very little work on trauma okay. and did a lot of work on life skills. Okay. Okay. Because sometimes we kind of know, like I kind of knew how to work through my trauma. I needed to write. I'm very into handwriting. I encourage everyone. There is nothing I don't believe besides our writing, going into a process. And this is different than typing. The reason why you want to handwrite or work with collage art or something is because it's a slower process that allows the physiology of your brain to move through, through your body and onto the paper mm -hmm. where, where like, um, typing is faster. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I writing my book worked me through trauma. I even integrated dissociative identity disorder and had no clue I'd done that wow. until I got with this counselor and took, um, the actual test for it, which was so grueling, like six hours long. I had to be there all day and take these breaks. Oh, gosh. Um, and so that was like exciting for me to go, wow, I did that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, she really helped me. Like, you do you realize what you've done for yourself? So it's good to find a good counselor. She was very versed in domestic violence. And I think that helped her understand the cult dynamics because they're not so different. Mm -hmm. The actual dynamics of being in a domestically violent relationship or a family cult yeah, where the, yeah. the, the parents are very authoritarian religious. Yeah, um, I am a big fan of CPTSD Foundation. Athena Milberg is a very dear friend of mine, and she is amazing. She has a, a bevy of therapists. She does daily phone calls, live phone calls. She understands religious trauma. She works with people who are religious and non-religious. Like there's no, so I'm a big, big fan of her network and just like, reaching out healing is yeah. messy we need love and support mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know around us through these times and just be careful who you connect with and listen to your gut you taught by the cult that that's demons and evil and you know the devil mm -hmm. scratching at your tummy no it's not mm -hmm, it's your instinct mm -hmm. never question it it does not matter that's how I live my life I don't question my instincts mm -hmm. anymore mm -hmm. and it sounds it feels right it's not <laughs> you know absolutely I, I always say you know those red flags those seeds of doubt don't mm -hmm. don't don't ever ignore them because usually intuition right. um, is a is a is a huge thing it's part of the you know of the of the survival instinct for a reason um and mm -hmm. unfortunately these groups are too good at getting people to ignore yes all those natural thoughts and feelings that that come up with things that don't make sense and things that are not good for us. Um, so just, yeah, never ignore those seeds of doubt. Um, but it sounds as if on top of 
working with your counsellor, you've worked through your own self-help techniques in finding that writing is something that works for you in terms of healing and working through things and and learning about yourself and and mm. kind of the, yeah. the process of working through your trauma as well. So that's that sounds like an incredible skill to have for somebody who has been through so much trauma. Thank you. It does. Writing has like saved me, you know, and then that's some other things too, like, um, back in the early eighties, I got introduced to this book called women who love too much. And it was all about codependency. Mm -hmm. And I just soaked that book up and I've never forgotten that book. I think it's good for anyone. It's even though it's entitled for women, it's a great book for, for males to read as well. And then the body keeps the score. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. Uh, that book is amazing. And it, and, and Bessel, I'm not going to try to mess up his last name. He's a doctor, but um, <laughs> he really puts together the, the, the trauma and the effects it has on your physical body. And how does your physical body keep the score of that trauma? So those things helped me. PTSD, Time to Heal by Kathy O'Brien really helped me. It really digs into how to work through triggers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I like anything where I can write. Um, like in Kathy's book, she leaves you room to write, you know, oh. as you're going through mm -hmm. it, which I love because I'm an all write in margins of books and stuff. Yeah. So and then I also created um, the gratitude when I launched like just like I had stickies all over my apartment <laughs> everywhere reminding me of who I really am. I did mirror work, looking at my face, but I, I designed a journal called Becoming Gratitude. Um, that takes you like 10 minutes in the evening. And it's a five week course, 13 bucks on Amazon. I created that book off of the system that I created to help get me through writing Cold Child. Okay, I had yeah, to sit yeah. down every night with my gratitude or else you write. It just helped me not be crippled too much to remember that. Yes, you had this trauma. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, mm -hmm. this world is beautiful mm -hmm. and people are beautiful. You just got to find them. And something that we spoke about in our emails um, that I know you're quite passionate about is um, resources for people who have left movements but were born into them or or or, or put through these same types of trauma at very young ages and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of um it seems to be that there is almost um like a a a, a hole in the world of resources yeah. in terms of mm -hmm. support for adults trying to readjust or reacclimate to typical everyday life when they've never mm -hmm. ever experienced that in their lives because they've grown right. up and been born into these movements so are there any resources for those people that you can list for us that, that, that we might be able to, to kind of give a shout out to and, and direct people towards? Well, you know, I live close to Jay-Z Knight's cult in Yelm. And I can tell you that I volunteer at domestic violence shelters and that's where they go. So a lot of times when people are leaving cults, they go to domestic violence shelters. Um, I look towards that and towards people who are versed with complex PTSD, because again, I find that, and I found that with my own psychologist, that many of the people that have left cults have found the best therapy with people who are versed with domestic violence, mm -hmm. because people who grow up as children in domestic violence homes or a spouse, they're in the same control. A lot of times they're not allowed to leave the home. They can't watch BET. They can't watch this. They, so she got it. She had never had a cult kid in her life. Right. 40 years of practice. And she got me because she understood control dynamics through domestic violence. Right. I think I found the best success with counselors that get that specifically. So, you know, when I was looking, like, honestly, I went down to the welfare office. I was like, I need help. Like now I need a counselor. I need somebody to talk to yeah, you. Like I feel yeah. like I'm dying. And she reached her hands across the table and said, honey, I got you. So don't be scared to walk into your domestic violence shelter, your local welfare office, and just be honest. Mm -hmm. I'm lost. That's where your resources are for immediate life of everyday life. Like you can read a million books but that don't pay the rent. 
No, no. That's when you're true. leaving a cult, you need to know how do I live? Where do I go live? Mm-hmm. Where am I going to get food? How do I apply for a job? Yeah. Those resources yeah. are at your local DSHS office. Yeah. And Could even be things like, there. how do I use public transport? How do I make yes. a phone call? They'll you know. give you a free bus pass. Mm-hmm. Domestic violence shelters give out free bus passes. Like they just really, I find, help you, support you in mm-hmm. basic life skills. And that's what cult survivors need. First and foremost is to feel stable and safe in their living space so that they can heal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, the emotional side of it. And you've mentioned that you've got your book as well, which sounds like it could be an incredible resource for somebody who's looking to find some solace in the fact that other people have been through these experiences and have come out of the other side and have made a life for themselves and have managed to you know find ways to heal and to to look at life and say you know there are things here that are beautiful um Mm. which is kind of um the vibe that I'm getting from you is, is that yeah. you managed to get yourself to that place. And yeah. you mentioned that there's a Survivor Voices Instagram page that I've just followed that you um oh, thank you have you. as well. Um so that's that's another that's another and we have a place. group on Facebook that you know anybody can join. Um, you know, you can share your story, we'll give you love. We try to laugh in there. You know, not all the time do we always want to talk about our trauma. Sometimes we want to wake up and laugh, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. you know, welcoming people to that. um, I have my own website, venicocious.com, and it's V-E-N-N-I-E-K-O-C-S-I-S.com. And you can click any of my book covers and it'll take you if you want to buy it. And also, I have a free monthly newsletter and it's called For the Thriving. And anybody can sign up um, and you'll see join the club in my in my um, menu. But I really love this newsletter because it's, it's very centered around positivity and resources. So any of these resources that people might be like, we put them in there. Um, and it's all about like, how do I thrive? How do I move from this? You know, you're a victim and then you become the survivor. And then that next step is thriving. Like, how do we get from that survivor step to Mm -hmm. that thriving Mm -hmm. step? And that's what I really center um, this newsletter around. And um, I have a great person on my team, Lisa Lamar, who has a column called Ask Auntie L. So people can send in questions. Yeah. And we'll feature your question and answer it for you. And again, it's free. Just throw your email in there and sign up. But um, that's the fastest way to find find me there and you can even contact me through email mm-hmm. on that page as, on my website as well so so that's really easy to find I'll, I'll pop that yeah. in the um sort of in the episode description as oh, well thank you. for people to okay. find and again on Amazon you can find Benny's book um, on paperback it's only $14 and for the Kindle version that's $8 so if you really want to know um, the ending that that Benny wouldn't um, talk us through, then then it's um, easily available, um, and it sounds super compelling from what you've told us. I know there's so much. I feel like we've really only scratched the surface, and I know there's so yeah. much more that, um, that 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 we haven't been told today because it is all available in your book. Um, Thank but you. unless you think there's anything we've missed, I think I've gone through all of my questions. Well, I just want to leave everyone with this quote. That is my favorite quote that I think about every day. Let go of that which has already served its purpose and accept the new without fear. Fantastic. That's great, Benny. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you. For trusting me with your story and for yeah. spreading awareness and just being a beautiful soul who can talk about things that are damaging and hurtful, but to let us know that there is greener grass on the other side if you can just yeah. h- hold yourself in, in in one piece and get through and yeah. and find a way to recover so I really appreciate you and I appreciate thank your time you. thank you so much I'm Benny. so honored thank you have a wonderful wonderful rest of your evening I will and you enjoy the rest of your day Benny I'll speak to you soon all right thanks, thanks bye. bye that is the end of this week's episode 
If you'd like to get in touch, you can do so by emailing me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, and this has been the Cult Vault. <laughs>